Hey folks, Lori Baltimore with another edition of Hyperwave. Hyperwave is the wavelength of wonder. It is the zenith between past and possibility, certainty and doubt. It is your destination when you have none, and you can find me here each week exploring the postmodern condition, also known as the hyperreal. So welcome. In this episode of Hyperwave, we'll be exploring the question, what is real? On the surface, it seems like a very simple question. In response to a question like that, you might even gesture with your hand at the world outside of you to give the most obvious and irrefutable answer. Surely that thing exists outside of me, and the many things there are exist with the other things. You're probably right. But today, we'll consider what exactly the thing you gestured at is and how we define it. The answer might surprise us both. Initiate Hyperwave. Before we get started, let me tell you something that blew my mind in true hyperwave fashion. Before 2016, the last time the Cubs had won the World Series, the Prussian Empire was still a thing. The Prussian Empire. Do you even know what Prussia ended up turning into? I don't. What the hell? Maybe Germany? Or like a couple other things that were connected to Germany? Like what the fuck? Not only that, but baseball has existed that long? There were empires? People think that living so long ago must have been really boring. No TV, no smartphones, no internet. To put it in perspective, how fucking bored did people have to be to invent baseball? Like seriously. No, nah, I'm just kidding. I like baseball, but shit, that is old, man. You get a really good idea just how much the world has changed in the last 200 years. Empires? There was, an, there was the emperor of Prussia and a president of the United States? That's just fucking crazy, man. Anyway. All right, so like I said, the question, what is real? is a pretty simple question, but I gotta tell you, I'm really, really excited about this episode. I think that it's going to be the most mind-bending. It's gonna be very interesting, so I'm very glad that you're here, and I'm really glad that I'm doing an episode on this, so let's go ahead and get started here. The answer to the question, what is real, it seems pretty intuitive, okay? But let's just go ahead and get on the same page. I think you and I can both agree that typically we'd attribute realness to whatever exists in the world. Trees, rocks, little booties, right? That would be anything we can interact with and anything that we interact with that also interacts with other things. So really what we're saying is all physical things are real. Boom. All right, we're making some progress. So I think you and I can also agree that ideas are real too, okay? They don't necessarily exist in the same capacity as physical things, but we can at least agree that they influence us and we interact with them, okay? The idea of being homeless, right, propels me to work at my job and get a lot of money and to save it so that I am not destitute on the street, okay? This is an idea that literally motivates my life goals, all right? So we can agree that ideas are real in a sense. Whether or not they exist in their own right outside of our brains is like another question altogether. So we won't get into that. But since we can use them, create them, and interact with them, they're real. All right. Now, quick question. Are unicorns real? Right? The ideas we have of them are real. But are unicorns real themselves? I'm going to go out on a limb and say we can agree that they do not. So we can whittle down the definition of what is real by saying that a real thing is real okay if we discover knowledge about it from experience rather than creating it okay this is essentially the difference between fiction and non-fiction fake things and stories um, aren't real so now we're cooking with oil all right we're really cooking with oil here we're really zoning in on the definition of what it means to be real so let's top this little dandy off by saying that we can further define realness as being possible okay being possible all right, now we would do this by looking at, say, a theory or something and judging it to be real if it is based on how we understand all the other real things, okay? So before we discovered black holes, it was only a theoretical thing that could exist. We'd never seen one, which by our criteria, um, you know, kind of said it wouldn't classify as a real thing. But the existence of black holes 
was based on scientific models of different forces and laws in the universe. Okay, It was possible and therefore more real than, say, a unicorn, which is part of a legend and not an understanding of the world. There's no way from our understanding of physics that a horse could fly. So we can distinguish further between fiction and nonfiction here. So this point can be summed up in saying that based on the world of real things, the possibilities we theorize are more real than other theoretical things like unicorns because they're based on realness. All right? This is when the fun stuff begins. We have a pretty solid definition of realness that I'm not really sure how a reasonable person could disagree. Okay, we went from experiential all the way down to the theoretical. So hold on to your hats because I think this is going to be a little more complicated than it seems. All right, let's start with something easy. Think about a green cube. It's one foot on all sides. It weighs a pound. Okay, it is made of steel. It has no flavor if you lick it. It's very smooth and cold. Now, it makes a nice sound when you knock on it too, okay? And it's sitting right in front of you. You, you hit it with your knuckle and it goes ping. It's very nice. Now, I want to ask you, is there any experience of that green cube that I haven't listed already? The answer is simply no. Any experience you'll have will come from your senses. And by describing the cube the way I did, you can pretty much know exactly what to expect from that cube and know exactly how to interact with it. For instance, don't drop it on your toe, use it as a doorstop, uh, don't lick it because it doesn't taste like anything. If you're cold, don't hold it because it's cold already. This leads me to the first thing we have to establish about real things, okay? Outside of our five senses, we have no way to experience them. All right, for instance, hummingbirds and other animals can see colors we can't, right? We are limited to our senses. There could be some other reality about the things around us that we could sense if we only had a sixth sense. Maybe it's seeing ghosts. Maybe it's seeing Bruce Willis in a hairpiece, right? No, but really, I mean, some animals can sense magnetic fields, all right? So because of this, there's something about the world that we're missing in our experiences. And I want to illustrate this with a good point here. Imagine you had the entire work of William Shakespeare. Shakespeare, right? Now imagine you could only read 200 different words. You had all of the works of Shakespeare and you had to read it through a filter of only 200 different words. Those would be the only words you would see when reading his work. All right, so maybe you'd get a good idea of what was going on, the events of the book. Maybe you'd be able to catch the string of the story, right? But you wouldn't be able to experience the lyrical nature or the subtle humor that Shakespeare is so famous for, right? So in that sense, you'd get the gist of the story, but not the Shakespearean essence of it all, right? You'd miss the bigger picture there. So in this way, our senses effectively filter out the bigger picture of the world that we're experiencing, right? So not only that, but consider consciousness itself, okay? It evolved in us as an edge in the natural world. It made us the apex predator. Our minds evolved to strategically order information in the world to make it more useful so we can have a better chance at survival. Now, really quick example with psilocybin mushrooms, okay? A trip on mushrooms leads to intensity of the senses and hallucinations, leaps in creative thinking, expansion of conscious presence, man. Now, you might think that this indicates an increase in brain activity. But studies have shown that during a trip, we experienced a very large decrease in brain activity. That's pretty fucking weird, right? This is because our minds are constantly taking information from our senses and putting it in an order that makes us better at using it. All the information we get from our senses through experience are rigidly structured to create a useful image of the world. Now, here's the important philosophical distinction here. Just because it's useful doesn't mean that the structure in our minds that all of our senses are put into is out there in the world, okay, as much as it is just a property of how our brains see the world, right? It's a structure we form the world into. It's not necessarily out there in that form, okay? Now, that's kind of unintuitive, all right? It's not really a point that's often brought up or thought about. Some even theorize that hallucinations from mushrooms are actually things in the world that our minds block out because they're not useful. 
All right, let me say that again. Some even theorize that hallucinations from mushrooms are actually things out in the world that our minds typically block out because they're not useful. Imagine a spy listening to a conversation 100 yards away with one of those guns that amplifies sound at a certain point, okay? To hear the conversation, the spy needs to filter out the other noise muddling the sound they're trying to listen to, right? The theory is that without structures in our mind ordering information and cutting certain things out, we would be overwhelmed with just how much phenomena we would experience and not survive very long, okay? So to keep track of where we are, our experiences are limited to five senses, and we are only able to think within the parameters of the way our brains structure that information. So that would mean that our experience of the real world is filtered twice. It's filtered two times, okay, before we can use it in our brain. Now, fair warning, I'm going to get a little more philosophical on you here for a couple minutes. Okay, I encourage you to stick around because it's really going to put the panache on this. It's really going to put the kibosh on it. All right, it's going to be real pretty cool. All right, so just hold your horses and listen to this, okay? So we're going to talk really quick about post-structuralism, okay? So post-structuralism is essentially a critique of how we gain knowledge and talk about things, okay? So as generally as I can say, the whole endeavor of post-structuralism was to show that when anybody is doing any research or theorizing about how we gain knowledge, like we've been pretty much doing this whole time, we accept certain things that everyone reasonably believes to be true, which makes a lot of sense, okay? One of these things could be that we perceive objects that exist outside of us. Nobody would rationally disagree with that within our current paradigm of understanding, okay? So post-structuralists like Michel Foucault or Michael Foucault, if you're a good American, spent their time looking at the basic assumptions of other civilizations throughout history to find that they were always changing. These basic assumptions were always changing, okay? I won't get into why they changed. That's just way too much for this episode, but they changed. Now you might be thinking, duh, they didn't know things. We did, okay? They were dumb. We're smarter now, okay? But this is where a post-structuralist would say, shut the fuck up. Okay, hold your horses. What they realized is that when we're looking back at old ways of understanding, we do find that there are lapses in knowledge. But the knowledge we discovered in itself was interpreted through a lens that was dependent on language, culture, and power structures. Now, what the hell does that mean, old LB? It means that when we're looking at the world and thinking about it and what is possible... We are always limited to modes of thinking that spell out the limits of our interpretations ahead of time. Because within a certain historical paradigm, people have their assumptions of what is and is not possible or real already laid out for them. So it would follow then that there's no such thing as progress in knowledge because the way we interpret and create it is dictated by language, culture, and power. So although what we know is increasingly useful, right? We, we have smartphones, we have laptops, we've been able to harness electricity all the way from the light bulb down to a cell phone. All right, we're getting better at using it. We're creating more useful models of understanding the world. But this usefulness does not indicate absolute truth or getting closer to an absolute truth. It just indicates that we have expanded the limits of older modes of thinking by adopting new assumptions that are less rigid. So it would seem that realness, truth, and possible, okay, as concepts, are all themselves based on assumptions which are always historically changing. In that way, what seems like self-evident truth to you and myself is simply us defining the limits of our own mode of understanding. Right, when I say, look at the world out there, one of the, the big assumption about that is that your consciousness is inside of you and the world outside of you is outside of you, okay? And now nobody would disagree with that. It would seem like crazy cuckoo la-la land to disagree with that, okay? But that is because that assumption is within its own paradigm of assumptions throughout a certain time in history, okay? 
And that assumption itself, post-structuralists would say, limits what we can understand to be possible. It limits our own faculties of understanding more and theorizing better, okay? We are subservient to modes of thinking that we don't even know we are operating in because our language and culture reinforce it as true, so we never dare to challenge them. And even if we want to challenge them, we have no idea how because we have no idea how anything else could be possible, right? Like I'm saying here, we don't even know how it could be possible to change the idea that the world is out there and our consciousness is in here, that there's an outside and inside world to the human experience. We have no way to really understand intuitively any type of criticism of that. Like, I mean, the the reverse of that theory would be that all of the world is in the same place, is that w the world out there is in here, is inside of your mind, just as the inside of your mind is out there. We That doesn't make sense to us, okay? We, that just doesn't seem possible. Do you know what I mean? Not because it's not, but because our own most basic assumptions about the world don't allow us to understand how that could be possible, right? Like if you'd only ever seen red and blue, but green was out there somewhere, you'd never ever be able to think of green before you saw it. You'd never even be able to make a theory about it because all you've ever seen is red and blue. Do you know what I mean? Now that is some mind blowing shit right there. That is crazy, man. And I, I encourage you to read um, some of the work of Michel Foucault. I think that if you really want to get an idea of what the fuck is going on in the world, you should read post-structuralist thought. And um, a really quick aside here is, you know, the whole post-structuralist movement leading into the postmodern movement is what a lot of people on the right are criticizing when they're talking about postmodernism. Um, <clears throat> people like Jordan Peterson. Oh, it's bloody mad. It's bloody mad. Go clean your room. You need to be... These postmodernists are destroying the will of the human being to exist in the world. Like, that that's what they're talking about. And it is some crazy shit. And it does lead to some crazy worldviews. But you should read about it because it's really interesting. Okay. Now, let's take a look at our initial definition of what realness is to, to put a nice bow on this. All right. So, number one, we experience it. We, we A real thing is something we can experience. Well... That experience we've shown is limited to the five senses, which filter the totality of everything into basic little chunks, right? Remember the Shakespeare comparison. Even if you could read two or 300 words, you'd still get the gist, but not the bigger picture. Okay, so number two definition of real things is that we can gain knowledge about it. Well, all of our knowledge of the world is five senses being put into a useful order by the evolutionary structures of our mind. So that initial experience of the total real world has now been filtered twice. So the thoughts we have about it are twice removed from the real thing, from the reality out there. All right, so the third thing we said about a real thing is that we can at least theorize about it based on other real things and understanding how other real things act. Well, not only are the other real things completely limited by our human faculties and our understanding, the theories we create about them are limited to historical constraints we can't even understand because we can't understand green when we only think red and blue are real. When red and blue constitute your worldview, green can't exist, right? That is some wild, crazy shit. It's shocking. It makes you wonder, how the fuck could you ever know what real is? It's like reality is is inaccessible to us. That we we're constantly imprinting our own human limitations on the real world out there. Right? That there is a thing that exists. There's clearly a world within which we operate. But the things in themselves, as Kant would say, the things in themselves are inaccessible to us. And even the knowledge structures we create to understand them are based on those limitations. How fucking crazy is that? Right? Whatever is real out there, like when you gestured with your hand, 
it might be that the gesture to things outside of us is the only communication general enough to capture it. The question isn't what is real. It is what is real to you. What aesthetic are you forming your life into? What is the point of your life? Do you want to wear Gucci and drive a Porsche? Do you want to live minimally without any possessions, man? Are you a priest or a drummer in a punk band? Who are you? Well, whatever is real to you will be whatever helps you realize that thing in yourself that compels you to action in whatever forms that fulfill you. Whatever is real to you is what brings you closer to that. It's what allows you to realize your own destiny. Okay, and I think the nugget here is that we would like to know. We want to know about the world because there is something there to know. We operate within something, okay? There's something there. We just can't reach it. It is inaccessible to us. Truth and absolute certainty and true, intimate, complete understanding, okay, is inaccessible to us because the world out there, we're given very minimal tools to reach it, okay? And what is real is a metaphysical question. On metaphysical questions, Nietzsche said that the answers to them are as useful as the chemical composition of water is to a sailor in a storm. Meaning that even if you fucking knew, right, what realness is, what what the real world is, that doesn't matter. That doesn't really matter to you. It's not going to affect your life very much. So don't worry too much about the real being inaccessible, getting hung up on these philosophical concepts, right, that you think are somehow monumental to shaping your worldview. They're not. They're not. What is truth? What is certainty? These are inconsequential to you. It wouldn't matter. This is a constant theme on my show. But all you can do is live sincerely and accept or deny things in a way that is advantageous to you realizing yourself. It would not matter. That type of abstract truth is inconsequential to you and your big life project for yourself. And your big life project for yourself, that thing you're turning yourself into, it isn't being in a band or getting a promotion or making a million dollars, driving in a Porsche. It's pursuing those things because they, in a sense, are you. Whatever mental scheme of the world allows you to act in it in a way that brings you closer to that, okay, brings you closer to that thing inside of you that you work your entire life to realize, that is as true as the things in themselves that we can't access. All we can do is gesture toward the world in that general expression. Your life is that gesture, and you become the thing at which you gesture. That's it for Hyperwave today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Follow me on Twitter at Baltimore Lori, B-A-L-T-I-M-O-R-E, Baltimore, L-O-R-I. And let me know what you thought of the episode. Give me some ideas of what to cover next. If you're listening to this on YouTube, please comment and subscribe. If you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, give me a nice follow, guys. I would love that. I would absolutely love that. In the next episode, we'll be covering the idea of morals as aesthetics and creating your life as a work of art. Okay? So we'll see you then. Do me a favor. Keep it real. Don't do anything stupid. And we'll be waiting for you here. Ooh, baby.